I've entitled my thoughts this morning, Giving of Thanks. And as you know, this week we have a national holiday that is very much also for us as Christians, what could be considered a religious holiday. I, as you know, am by no means a very festive preacher. You know that I do not let the American culture hijack my messages. I have said it many times that if I allowed the various holidays that we have scheduled on the calendar each year to affect my preaching, then at least one sermon every month, if not every six weeks, would be devoted to one of the days that we have. And I think since we've had social media, we learned that every day is some special day. They have a special day for everything and everyone. And so we, we try to stick with the word here and you know, our particular American holidays are not necessarily something that we spend a lot of time focusing on, but Thanksgiving is a special day, and this year in particular, I felt it on my heart to speak on the subject of Thanksgiving as it is the day, or it will be this Thursday, the day that we call, the day that we know as Thanksgiving. Let's just say that when we're having a season such as our present season, as we face the trials and the confusion and the suffering that we seem to be enduring in our world at present, the message of being thankful is so easily forgotten. Do you not feel that way as we hear the news at night? What's the last thing that people talk about as they, I would even use the word rage on the television? You just have confusion and anger and animosity. The last thing that you hear is thankfulness. As we think about the suffering that this pandemic has caused and some 260,000 people losing their lives in our country to that, the word thankful isn't a word that comes to our mind. As we look at the animosity and the anger between people that sometimes boils over as violence in the streets, as you see people rioting, they're not thankful. There's no thanksgiving when men take rocks and hurl them through the glass storefronts of businesses and steal things and burn the building down. That's not Thanksgiving. And so I think that this year on Thanksgiving in particular is a time that it's as important as it has ever been for us to be reminded that we need to be thankful people, that we're to be a group of people who walk in Thanksgiving each and every day of our lives. I was talking to my father on the phone this morning, and we were, he was up getting an update on a, a child that had recently been hospitalized for COVID-19. He was just curious and asking about it as he and my mother were discussing that. And we were talking about Thanksgiving, the day, the holiday, whether or not we would go down because we're undecided if we're going to go and, and mingle with family just for their safety and for their sake and how sad it would be if we couldn't. But he he just blurts out the statement, well, you know, every day is Thanksgiving to me. And that's the way that we ought to frame our perspective. Every day ought to be Thanksgiving for me. Every day ought to be Thanksgiving for you. But it's so very important to hear in our present day and age that we need to be, we ought to be. We have a lot of reason to be thankful to God. Amen. We're called on to be thankful as those who name the name of Christ, we're called to be thankful, called on to be thankful. This is one of those words that we use every day, we ought to use every day, but we might need a little help to frame exactly what the definition of the word is, and so we'll talk a little bit about how we define these terms. We'll just say up front that the opposite of being thankful is to be ungrateful. And so if I am thankful, then I'm not ungrateful. If I am ungrateful, I am not thankful. Much like dark and light, hot and cold, belief and unbelief, the degree to which we are one directly affects the degree to which we are the other. And so the more thankful I am, the less I will be ungrateful 
And the least thankful I am, the more I will be ungrateful. The more ungrateful I am, the less thankful I will be. We have so many times in our lives this tug of war between being thankful and being ungrateful to God for all of his blessings, just like we have the tug of war between belief and unbelief. Every one of us has that battle to face if we're born of God. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. We might borrow that language and rephrase it today. Lord, I'm thankful, help my ungratefulness. Help me, dear God, to be thankful and grateful for everything that you have so graciously given me in my life. That'll be the last thing that we talk about today the things that God has given us, the many blessings that we have. As we begin today, the New Testament word that so commonly translates thanksgiving, and the word occurs, I believe, if memory serves, about 29 times in the Bible in that form. And if you look up the words giving of thanks and thanks and things such as that, there are many, many more times. But the word translates from Eucharistia, as it would be pronounced in Erasmian Greek. A modern Greek would refer to that as Eucharistia. Eucharistia. Interestingly enough, this word is still used in the modern Greek today. The only difference in it is that it has changed pronunciation a little bit. One of the little marks of punctuation to help the pronunciation of that has been dropped. Otherwise, it's the identical word. Now, that's interesting to me because among other orders of people, it's always interesting to see a word that has lasted more than 2,000 years in the native tongue Lexicons change, and I would argue that the English language has been forever frozen by the King James Bible. The same way that the English language has been frozen by the King James Bible, the Greek language has been frozen largely because of its use in a religious or liturgical sense. The word Eucharist is another word for communion. It's a word that other orders of people use. People who are more liturgical will refer to communion as the Eucharist. And that is literally a transliteration of this word that comes into our English language as thanksgiving. Eucharistia, thanksgiving, the giving of thanks. And again, this word is frozen in time through its religious and liturgical usage. But the word thanksgiving in English, the language that we speak and know, the word that we will be using so often today, simply is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as the expression of thankfulness or gratitude. Now, it's a combination of two words, thanks and giving. Thanks and giving. And so thanksgiving is to then do what? To give thanks. We have a day on our calendar every year and the sole purpose of that day is for us to come together and to give our thanks back to God. To give our thanks back to God. The definition in the OED continues, especially the acts of giving thanks to God. So in the English language, though you can give thanks, you can say thank you to any person who has done something to you that was a blessing to you. The act of thanksgiving... The word thanksgiving finds its setting and its context in the adoration and praise of God as a religious offering unto him. Now, we think about the history of American culture and how far we have fallen as a people in our devotion to him. We have a national holiday every year called Thanksgiving, and I want to go ask half the people in this country, who are you thanking? Oh, universe, we thank you for your molecules. Oh, great. That one will work on Mars. There's no turkey on Mars. But we have a day called Thanksgiving because our forefathers in this country set aside a time. They consecrated a day. They sanctified a day to say thank you to the God of creation who has blessed us with our country, the bounty of this land, the food, the water, the shelter, the protection, and so largely the freedom to gather and worship as we have gathered to worship today. Again, this is the expression of thankfulness or gratitude, especially the acts of giving thanks to God. Thanksgiving is a religious word. And as we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, I want you to understand what we're thanking God for 
and in particular, who we're thanking for all of the blessings that we've enjoyed in our land for now more than 200 years, well over 200 years. In the Baptist faith, our forefathers felt so strongly about this that when Thanksgiving became a national day for us to observe, they consecrated it in addition to what the population in general consecrated it, and they turned it into a day of worship. It was for them almost as a festival, a feast, or a Sabbath. Our particular association, which is the oldest Baptist association in the state of Alabama, voted that this day would be set aside as a time of worship and even sometimes fasting among our churches. And so on Thanksgiving Day, that Thursday in November, our churches, rather than meeting and with family and eating a turkey and pie and watching a parade and perhaps a football game, maybe getting online and doing some shopping early before the stores open on Black Friday, they would meet and they would worship just like we're worshiping here today. And knowing them and knowing what I know about them, they probably didn't just meet from 1030 to 12. Oh, no. Those saints would worship. And they would come together. They would sing for 30 minutes. They would have an hour or two of preaching. They would break for lunch. They would come back together and have more singing and more preaching. We are lightweights compared to our Baptist forefathers when it came to enjoying and you might even say enduring the public worship experience. You read back through the old association minutes and you see these times when people came together and how they had preacher after preacher after preacher. Then they would split up at night to go to different homes and they would have different ministers preach to different groups of people in different homes. They just enjoyed preaching all day and all night. It was real to them. And if you read the, the subject matter, we as Americans, we always want the practical subject where we find a 10-step program for living a life that is better in this world, but the messages would be Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, Ephesians chapter 1, John chapter 6. And in those days, the faith was very strong. They loved to hear doctrinal preaching, and they would come into a room and hear it all day long. And it would attract people from the community. Windows would be open. People would be looking in from the outside because worship meant something in that day. Maybe our Thanksgiving this year could resemble that more, in our homes at least, than it has resembled or it will resemble our recent Thanksgivings here in America. But our forefathers took this very seriously. First thing that I want to do with you this morning is consider some New Testament passages commending Thanksgiving to us. Not the day that we've set on the calendar, but the act of giving thanks to God. Secondly, we want to look at the practice of giving thanks in the New Testament, followed by Thanksgiving from the Psalms. And lastly, we want to look at Thanksgiving even as an Old Testament sacrifice. And of all the things that I read this week and studied this week, one point in particular that pertained to the Thanksgiving offering in the Old Testament was the most interesting to me. I love when I read a passage of Scripture and I learn something new. Isn't that an amazing feeling? There was a point that I learned from that this week that to me was new and invigorating, encouraging, and edifying. We're going to save that point from Scripture for the last. As we turn to the New Testament and look at some occurrences of the word thanksgiving, the first that we want to consider today is Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. And we're going to consider more scripture today than we usually do in a sermon. So if you want to have your fingers ready, we're going to turn from passage to passage, give you a point from each of these scriptures, and then move along. Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Now, if you're unaware, the book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians are sister epistles. They are believed to have been written by Paul at the same time in the same predicament to two churches, the church at Colossae and the church at Ephesus. The sister passage then to Colossians, 
Colossians chapter 4, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, would be when Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said for them to pray always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And we recently talked about that passage as we studied the concept of prayer. And so these are sister passages. They convey the same point. One says to continue with all perseverance and supplications. The other one says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Okay? So the point that I want to give you from this passage is we will look at at least two other passages from the New Testament. Thanksgiving is coupled, it is connected with prayer. Thanksgiving is coupled with prayer. We're going to look at some passages from the Psalms in a moment that connect thanksgiving with another act of worship and devotion. But from Colossians chapter 4, we learn that thanksgiving is connected with prayer. In other words, we continue in prayer and we watch in the same, in what? In prayer with thanksgiving. And so we watch, we persevere in prayer, as Ephesians 6 says, making supplication for all saints we watch, we continue, we endure in prayer, and as we pray, we pray with thanksgiving. We pray with thanksgiving. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. We have used this passage in our sermons more this year than in any other year since I have been here. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about COVID. Don't worry about the election. Don't worry about riots. Don't worry about economic collapse. Does that mean none of those things are threats? No, they're all threats. But we don't worry about them. We might prepare for them. We pray about them. But we never worry about them. Careful there means full of care, anxiety. We cast our cares upon him, for he careth for us. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. In other words, prayer, thanksgiving, is to be coupled with prayer and it is presented here as an alternative to worry. So you sisters in particular, I know you, and I know that you struggle so many times in this life with worry. Rather than worrying, what we do, what we are to do, is to pray and let our supplications be made known to God with thanksgiving. So instead of worrying about it, think about all of the vain energy that has been consumed this year in worry. Now, which one of you, by taking thought, can add a cubit to his stature? We can't worry our way into success or deliverance, but we can cry out unto God, and as we cry out unto God, we are to do so with thanksgiving. Dear God, this is what we need, and I thank you so much for all of your blessings. We pray... We let our cares be made known unto him. Our supplication, remember we defined that a, a month ago as humble beggings. I hope you remember that definition. Our supplications, our humble beggings, we make our humble beggings known to God with thanksgiving as an alternative to worrying, to being careful or full of care. And so thanksgiving with prayer is associated with or thanksgiving is associated with prayer and is presented as an alternative to worry. Back to the book of Colossians, Colossians 2 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And I love the word there, receive. My mailbox receives mail, but it doesn't do anything to accept or reject it. It just accepts the mail because the mail is put in it. As you've received him, walk in him. In other words, if you're alive in him, walk like it, act like it. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. 
abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, this book of Colossians, we talked about it last week. Paul is confronting two things in the book of Colossians. You have his confronting of Gnosticism, which was an early heresy that denied the deity of Christ and taught just inconceivable false doctrine that led to much immorality and ungodliness. And he's confronting Gentile philosophy. The Gentile society in this day was inundated with philosophy. You see in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Paul is warning against philosophy and Gnosticism. But you notice that he equates here. We have another association, if you will, an associating of this term. Thanksgiving is associated with maturity. In the faith. Rooted, what does a plant do when it puts down roots? It grows in strength and it's harder to knock over. It is one that can endure and last through drought. Rooted and built up. So you've got bottom growth, you've got top growth. This is talking about personal discipleship that will even strengthen the church here in Colossae. Rooted, that's down growth. Built up, that's top growth. Established in the faith, uh, faith, which means to be stabilized. Look at the root there, established, stabilized. In the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And so spiritual maturity should lead to thanksgiving. There are associated concepts in the Word of God. And lastly, as we consider New Testament passages... In the book of Revelation chapter 7, which is a beautiful glimpse into heaven. In Revelation chapter 7, we read the language that we love so much that John beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palms in their hands, and they cry to God. Notice what we read in verse 12. These angels and these elders fall upon their faces, and they worship God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Thanksgiving even continues into the next world. Oh, that we would spend our days thanking Him now to the best of our ability as we will perfectly do after the resurrection for all of eternity. God will be worshipped with thanksgiving by His people for all time in heaven. Heaven is a place of thanksgiving, giving of thanks, being made unto God. Turning to the Gospels, there are two passages that I want to share you wherein our Savior gave thanks. The first of these is, Located in the book of Matthew chapter 15. And this is the occurrence of Jesus, one of the occurrences of Jesus dividing the loaves and the fishes. Had a conversation this week with some preacher friends and they were all lamenting that they all feel so insignificant to the task that they have at hand as pastors. And one of the brothers came out and said, well, anytime I'm discouraged about my own inability and my insufficiency as a minister, I just remember the loaves and the fishes, how God can take something so little and use it to bless so many people. Jesus divides the loaves and the fishes. He took the seven loaves and the fishes in this occurrence, and he gave thanks, and he broke them, and he gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. He did what? He gave thanks. The giving of thanks, which is to say thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Jesus divides the loaves and the fishes to feed all of these people. The first thing that he does, though he is God incarnate, is thank God above for the food that his people would eat. He gave thanks. In the communion service before Jesus took the bread and the wine and divided it among his disciples. 
and told them, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Take, drink, this is my blood which is shed for you. Luke twenty two nineteen. He took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. When we take communion here, you notice that we try to follow that pattern. We need to have communion soon. I miss communion. Before this year is over, we're going to have a safe, brief communion service at some point. We may not wash feet. That's been the common thing for our people to do this year. We may not wash feet, but we're going to have communion. We need communion. We need communion. Jesus takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks it. He gives thanks, that is. He breaks it. He divides it among his people. Even at the Lord's Supper, he gave thanks. Likewise, also the cup after supper. This is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. He gave thanks, and he distributed it among them. Turning to the Psalms for some inspiration and example and clarity on Thanksgiving. There are three Psalms that we want to turn to that use the word Thanksgiving. Psalm 69 and verse 30. The psalmist writes, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Now, one of the things that I noticed as we were, as I was considering scripture for this message today, first of all, as we saw from the New Testament, you have thanksgiving associated with prayer. You have thanksgiving associated with maturity. Obviously, if you study the Word of God, you know how dependent we are upon Him. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Every good thing we have comes from the hand of God. And as we study the teachings of Christ to His disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, we read that His Son rises upon the good and the evil, and His reign falls upon the just and the unjust. Even the natural provision that we have the providence we have through creation is given as a blessing from his hand the more we learn the more thankful we ought to be because the more we realize how dependent we are upon him and so thanksgiving is associated with maturity it's associated with meals and food and sustenance as we read from jesus ministry but here in psalm 69 we find it in the psalms associated with singing Now, I want to make a point with this just as we pass through here. What is the book of Psalms? The book of Psalms is the hymnal, if you will, of ancient Israel. Technically speaking, it would be referred to as their Psalter. A Psalter is a collection of Psalms to be sung. We have at least two Psalms in our hymnal. We sang one of them Wednesday night. I would love to sing more of the psalms. And so one day, my goal is to purchase some psalters and distribute them in the pews so we can say, let's sing Psalm 100 or Psalm 23. And we pull it out and we sing that psalm in our language as we worship God. You know you're always singing a theologically correct song if you are singing from the Psalms. Now, I'm sure this has happened to a number of us here. When you call out a song or a song is called out because it has a great tune and you get about halfway through the song and you think, whoa, this is not accurate at all. One of the hymns in our hymnal, I have no idea how it got there, is the hymn Gethsemane. And if you read the hymn Gethsemane, It talks about how sin was laid on him in Gethsemane and how he suffered for our sins and bore our sins in Gethsemane. And when we have sung that once before, it was probably five years ago, I jumped up, I ran around, and I stopped us after verse 1, and I said, instead of Gethsemane, let's say Calvary, because it was upon Calvary that my sins were laid upon him, not in Gethsemane. 
See, there was an idea that spread through Christianity decades ago that part of the atonement was made in Gethsemane, in the garden, when Jesus wept. Well, that's not the case. That's not the case at all. How did those hymns get in our hymnals? I don't know. But you know <laughs> when you're singing from the Psalms that what you are singing is correct because God the Spirit did inspire it to be used by God's people. You know you're on safe ground when you're singing from the Psalms. And so I would love for us to one day consider buying some Psalters and incorporating that into our worship. I'll give you a little bit of a, a hint on that. I was considering the Trinitarian Bible Society Psalter. They're stalwart defenders of the King James Bible. I'm preaching from a Trinitarian Bible Society KJV this morning. And then I found out that one of our own brothers, Elder Joe Holder, has actually been working on a project to take all of the psalms that can be sung to common meter, which is like Amazing Grace and several other tunes, and he's working on his own Psalter to be published and used by our people. So when that's accomplished, perhaps God would bless us to add that as a part of what we sing here. I would love to sing the Psalms that God gave us to God. But what do we notice here in Psalm 69 and verse 30? I will praise the name of God with a song <coughs> and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Singing is associated with thanksgiving. What do we do when we sing? We thank Him. We give our thanks to Him. Singing praises to God is one of the most pure, emotional, deeply spiritual ways that we can tell God thank you for all that He has done for us. When we sing from the, the Spirit, from the heart, making melody in our hearts to God. We worship Him in spirit and in truth. We mean it, we feel it, and we are filled then with the Holy Spirit as we sing in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The 95th Psalm, Psalms 95 and verse 2, I believe. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto him. How? With psalms. Let's look at the first verse of that. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. When we sing, it is to be a joyful noise. I love the fervor with which you sing here. Because I have some extra time based upon how far we are and the thoughts that I want to share with you today, I'm going to indulge in a tangent. When we sing to God, it should be with great fervor. It should be with great intensity, which, by the way, is why the song service that we have each Sunday is so important. Because we're worshiping Him. We're giving Him our thanks in a song. We go into His house and we sing. Sometimes we get too caught up on the perfection that we miss the spiritual benefit. I love that it sounds pretty when we sing here. Amen? But you don't have to sound like a choir to praise God. And God isn't more impressed with my singing if I'm perfectly in pitch than if I'm off-key belting it out at the top of my lungs. Now, I have no problem with learning to sing, but you are not a choir, you are a congregation, and there is a difference. Choirs sing for the perfection, for the love of the arrangement, for the experience of singing something that is new or something that is old and historic. We have some here in our congregation who love to sing with choirs, and that's great. My wife will tell you, who has sung now for more than a decade with the Huntsville Community Chorus, if I want that, I'll go there. When I come to church, I want to sing and feel it. And there is a great difference in the way it looks and sounds when we're feeling it than when we're just trying to make it sound perfect 
so we can impress ourselves and other people who walk in. For, for any of the young people who are watching today, maybe online, one of the troubling things that I've seen around the singing school atmosphere is when it becomes about the cool kids club who can do me so the best and all of the worship just goes out the window and it becomes about doing it perfectly. L listen to me. I'm a professional trumpet player who teaches as well. I know all about doing things perfect and I know also how that can ruin what I'm trying to do. It's amazing that I can play 200 right notes and hit one wrong note in an inopportune time and it'll ruin a gig for me. This is not about that. We've got to tear down that idol and come before him with sincere singing and worship and adoration where it's not about sounding precise. Again, that's not to say we shouldn't learn to sing and learn to read music and learn the harmony parts. No, those are all helpful tools. But that's not what this is about. This is about worshiping him. Let me tell you, I have known people in my life who were literally tone deaf. Very few people are really tone deaf. Most of us are just untrained. I had a band director who told me that one time, and he gave me little methods for helping people who can't sing in pitch learn how to listen for the pitch and be more in tune with those that are around them. And the key is listening. The key is listening. Very few people are actually tone deaf. But God is just as pleased with a completely tone deaf person singing praise to Jesus with tears rolling down their faces. In fact, he's probably more pleased with someone who's worshiping him that way than someone who's thinking, I'm doing this so well. Listen how good I sound. Let us all beware. One of my favorite non-primitive Baptist preachers says, if you can't say amen, say ouch. I'm stepping on my own toes in so many ways. Thanksgiving is associated with singing in the Psalms. We come into his house, we make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation, we come before his presence with thanksgiving, and we make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great king above all gods, that is that which people think are gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, and strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he has made it. His hands has formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. Does that sound familiar to you? Paul quotes it in the book of Hebrews, written to you. As in the day of the temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. What was their problem according to the book of Hebrews? Unbelief. Thanksgiving in Psalm is a therapy for unbelief. Because he presents it as the alternative for such. Rather than being unbelieving, we should come into his house, whatever it takes, and we should worship him with singing. Psalm 100. We sang and we read this one Wednesday night. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Again, anytime you read the word sheep with reference to a person, you're reading about a child of God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Here we are, as lovers of His truth, generations after this has been written, understanding that His truth will endure to all generations. His word shall not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but His word shall not pass away. 
We enter into his house, we enter into his gates, we make a joyful noise, we come before him with gladness and with singing. How so? Entering into his gates with thanksgiving. But there's a final point that I want to share with you today from the Old Testament, and this is in regards to the Old Testament offering of thanksgiving. You know, the Old Testament law contained many different types of offerings, many different festivals, many different feasts. We learned recently as we studied the concept of substitutionary atonement that there was a scapegoat and a goat that would be offered. And you have all of these various days. The Passover was another one where an animal had to be offered and slaughtered. You just have offering after offering after offering. The Passover was to be a specific day of the year, whether they wanted to do that or not. They couldn't have it more than they wanted to. Wouldn't you like to have Thanksgiving once a month? Baptists like to eat. I saw a meme this past week, and I've seen it a few times, but it was a church fan. It said, Faith Baptist Church, but when you open the sliding door, it said, Fat Baptist Church. And I thought, boy, that's prophetic. As soon as this old nonsense with COVID is over, I look forward to potlucks. I've gone since February without your food, and it's driving me crazy. Now, for pastor appreciation and for my birthday, you guys gave me gift cards, and so I've had Baumhauer's wings, and I've gone to all kinds of other places to eat, and it's been great, but I miss eating with you, and I miss eating your food, especially the food part. I miss that. Fat Baptist Church. They couldn't have Passover as often as they wanted. They had it when? Once a year. It was on a certain day of their calendar year. All of these various offerings that they were to have, the atonement had to be a certain day of the year, every year as God prescribed. There were times where they would offer an offering when a child was born or when an animal had its first child. All of these various offerings at specific times. If they had come into contact with something that was unclean, Certain days or events called for an offering. But there's this one offering in the Old Testament that was to be done according to their will. When they wanted to do it, as they wanted to do it. I would use the word spontaneously, and I would use the word voluntarily. And it is the feast of thanksgiving. Or rather the offer, I should say, of thanksgiving. Now, we find this introduced to us in Leviticus chapter 7, and verses 12 through 15. Let's look up at verse 11. This is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord, if he shall offer it for a thanksgiving, for a giving of thanks. Then shall he offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. He goes on to talk about the oblation and sprinkling of blood and the flesh. The sacrifice of the flesh for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. Turn over to Leviticus chapter 22 and verse 29. There's a phrase in here that I want to grab. Talks about the offering of animals. Whether it be a cow or a ewe, you shall not kill it and her young both in one day. And when you will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord, offer it at your own will. On the same day it shall be eaten up, leave none for tomorrow. I am the Lord. I've made the point several times this year that you can find deep lessons about Christ, about salvation, about the way we are to live in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, which most people esteem one of the driest portions of God's Word, and it's far from it. It's one of the most rich. What do you learn from that passage, the Thanksgiving sacrifice, sacrifice of Thanksgiving? The last phrase in verse 29, offer it, At your own will. This means this is something that you should want to do, you'll want to do, and then you do it. 
What is the point that we can glean from this? Remember, the law is a schoolmaster. Search the scriptures in them. You think you have eternal life there. They which testify of me. The law was a shadow of good things to come. What can we learn from Thanksgiving? It's to be done at our own will. From the law, God communicates that acts of thanksgiving are to be voluntary of our own desire to thank Him. Spontaneous, purposeful, of our own will, giving thanks to Him. God, I want to stop what I'm doing and I want to offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving to simply say thank you for everything that you have done for me. Even in the law, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, though everything else was so rigid, was to be of their own will. In other words, their desire. We offer that, they offered that. When they felt so thankful for what God had done for them. You say, Brother Ben, we don't offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving in today's time because Christ fulfilled the law, and you're right. But we do offer the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips, as we sing and we make melody to Him in our hearts, praising Him for His goodness and His mercy. Now, I want to end our thoughts today with a simple exercise that I believe will cause you to enjoy feeling thankful. I believe it will foster thanksgiving in your heart. This year we focus so much on our trials, and this has been a year of great diverse trials. So many different types of affliction and tribulation and suffering and confusion and we focused on it. We've talked about it. I've tried as a pastor to give messages that at appropriate times maybe encourage you, maybe distract you, maybe give clarity for how to handle it, and maybe explain why some of these things are perhaps happening in the world around us. And it's been imperfect, but it's been what I've tried to do. We focused a lot on the trials. I want you to take a moment to think about all the blessings. This morning, at some point, you opened your eyes. You looked around. You were awake. You were awake because it is a new day. His mercies are new every morning. And God blessed you to wake up one more time. You are alive. You probably took a shower and praise God for hot water, clean water, in your home with electricity that's nice, with air conditioning or heat, so it's always 70 degrees, and used a clean towel to dry yourself off. Modern dentistry's given you toothbrush and toothpaste and mouthwash to clean up and make up and a hairbrush. Every single bit of that is a blessing. You went and sat down in your kitchen and you poured yourself a cup of coffee. So many times when I wake up and I pour myself a cup of coffee, I sing it's the most wonderful time of the year, but I changed the word year to day the most wonderful time of the day because I'm pouring a cup of coffee. I love to drink coffee in the morning. What a blessing that was to have fresh, hot coffee this morning. And then you ate breakfast. Praise God for the breakfast you ate this morning. The media makes a living on bad news. And there's some bad news in the world, but I want you to understand how much you personally are blessed right this moment in human history. Every meal, every day, 
Every kind word. You know, what a blessing it is to come into this place and hear you welcome one another each and every Sunday. To say, hey, it's good to see you. That's a blessing for which we should be thankful. The means of your income. Thank you, dear God, for the job that you've provided for me to be able to feed my family, to provide shelter over their heads and clothing for them to wear. Oh, dear God, what blessings you've given us in this land. We don't even compute what Jesus meant when he told his disciples. And Paul reiterates, if you have food and raiment, to be content. If I have raiment, if I have clothes, to be content. Who doesn't have clothing? Some young ladies you see around town kind of look like they don't have clothing, but that's voluntary. Like, do we have a fabric, fabric shortage with the toilet paper shortage? I don't know. We have a closet and a chest of drawers full of clothing. Oh, we've got so much to be thankful for. A fridge with food. And if you don't have a fridge with food, then come talk to me after church and it'll be taken care of by 3 o'clock because we got a couple of deacons that are chomping at the bit to get something done. Our homes, our automobiles, our friends. You know what a blessing it is to have friends in this world? Our family. God has given us family. Beyond that, how thankful ought we to be for our church? Think about it a minute. Think about it. God has blessed you to not merely be a part of Christianity, but to be a part of a group of people who don't have to have seeker sensitive this or that or laser and light shows or fog machines, but to come into an old building that's comfortable and beautiful and sit down with like-minded people and hear the sweet gospel of salvation, not by your works, but by his grace, not promising you ease in this life, but strength through the trials with the hope of eternal glory where you get to sing and it doesn't matter. You know, one of the things that one of our dear brothers told us last year when he joined the church and requested baptism was when he came in here, we didn't respond to him like he was just some long-headed tattooed dude off the streets. Do you remember that? It doesn't matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what your past has been. If you love Jesus, if you love Jesus, then he's taken away your sin. He's taken away your reproach. He has made you clean. This is a home for you. What a blessing we have in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can't take that away. They've tried for 2,000 years, and they failed. Most importantly, oh, how we ought to be thankful for Christ, our Savior, who came into this world, who was made us, like unto one of his brethren, lived among us, walked among us, suffered among us, suffered for us, bore our sins upon the cross, that we can live with him in a pure, spotless, sin-free world after this world of confusion and trial and sorrow comes to an end. Amen. I hope that this week is a week of thanksgiving for all of us, no matter if we have to quarantine at home, or if we enjoy fresh turkey with our family, if we enjoy a burnt bird and green dressing with too much sage. My grandmother always made the greenest, grossest dressing that a man could ever eat. She doesn't have the internet, so she's never going to hear that. But we went over there because we loved her. That was the important part. The turkey was immaterial, thank goodness. 
whether we are abased, whether we abound, may we give thanks to God in all things. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the many blessings that you've given us. Lord, we know that there are enough reasons in this moment in time to be eternally thankful and grateful to you. Lord, you told Adam in the day that he sinned that in the day he eats thereof, he'll surely die. And every moment of life that every human has had from that point forward has been a mercy because we deserve to be wiped off the face of this planet and the whole universe destroyed. But you sent your son to die for us that we could be with you and enjoy you forever. Lord, in this life, so many times, as Psalm 23 says, you have prepared a table for us and even the presence of our enemies. And so, dear God, we thank you so much for blessing us in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation among whom we shine as lights. Help us, Father, to be thankful. Lord, we pray that we would be always praying and that our prayers would be prayers of thanksgiving. We pray, Father, we would grow in maturity and that it would lead to thanksgiving. We pray that we thank you for all that we enjoy as your Son taught us, our Savior, by way of example. And, Lord, we pray that we would praise you and thank you by way of singing and psalm and song. Lastly, Lord, as the children of Israel were to, of their own free will, offer unto you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, we pray, Lord, that we would be compelled by our this will that we have, because we know we're made in your image. We know that you've given us a will. We know that will is only as good as our nature, but you've given us the nature of your Son. We pray, Father, that we would will to, that we would choose to offer unto you the thanksgiving that you so deserve. This week, every day, and forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all Pray.